Hey, Alpha Nurses, I'm the Sandra from alphanurseguide.com. This is NCLEX Review number two, 78 practice questions. You can get my study guides on Etsy. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok for more content. All links are in the description. Without the way, let's get started. The nurse is providing care to a client admitted to the hospital with a diagnosis of anxiety disorder. The nurse is talking with the client, and the client says, I have a secret that I want to tell you, you won't tell anyone about it, will you? Which is the appropriate nursing response? A. No, I won't tell anyone. B. I cannot promise to keep a secret. C. If you tell me the secret, I will tell it to your doctor. D. If you tell me the secret, I will need to document it in your record. The correct answer is B. I cannot promise to keep a secret. Rationale, the nurse should never promise to keep a secret. Secrets are appropriate in a social relationship but not in a therapeutic one. The nurse needs to be honest with the client and tell the client that a promise cannot be made to keep the secret. Following a group therapy session, a client approaches the nurse and verbalizes a need for seclusion because of uncontrollable feelings. The nurse reports the findings to the charge nurse and expects that the charge nurse will take which action. A. Call the client's family. B. Place the client in seclusion immediately. C. Inform the client that seclusion has not been prescribed. D. Get a written prescription from the health care provider and obtain an informed consent. The correct answer is D. Get a written prescription from the health care provider and obtain an informed consent. Rationale A client may request to be secluded or restrained. Federal laws require the consent of the client, unless an emergency situation exists, in which an immediate risk to the client or others can, others can be documented. The use of seclusion and restraint is permitted only on the written prescription of the health care provider, which must be reviewed and renewed every 24 hours depending on state law requirements. It must also specify the type of restraint to be used. A client with delirium becomes agitated and confused at night. The best initial intervention is which of the following? A. Move the client next to the nurse's station. B. Use a night light and turn off the television. C. Keep the television and a soft light on during the night. D. Play soft music during the night and maintain a well-lit room. The correct answer is B. Use a night light and turn off the television. Rationale, it is important to provide a consistent daily routine and a low stimulation environment when the client is agitated and confused. Noise levels, including a radio and television, may add to the confusion and disorientation. Moving the client next to the nurse's station is not the initial intervention. Which nursing interventions are appropriate for a hospitalized client with mania who is exhibiting manipulative behavior? Select all that apply. A. Communicate expected behaviors to the client. B. Enforce rules and inform the client that he or she will not be allowed to attend therapy groups. C. Assist the client in developing means of setting limits on personal behavior. D. Follow through about the consequences of behavior in a non-punitive manner. F. Be clear with the client regarding the consequences of exceeding limits set regarding behavior. The correct answers are A. Communicate expected behaviors to the client. C. Assist the client in developing means of setting limits on personal behavior. D. Follow through about the consequences of behavior in a non-punitive manner. And F. Be clear with the client regarding the consequences of exceeding limits set regarding behavior. Rationale, interventions, for dealing with the client exhibiting manipulative behavior, include, setting clear, consistent, and enforceable limits on manipulative behaviors, being clear with the client, regarding the consequences of exceeding limits set, following through with the consequences, in a non-punitive manner, and assisting the client, in developing means of setting limits, on personal behaviors. Enforcing rules and informing the client that, he or she, will not be allowed to attend therapy groups, are violations of a client's rights. The nurse observes that a client is psychotic, pacing, and agitated, and is making aggressive gestures. 
The client's speech pattern is rapid and the client's effect is belligerent. Based on these observations, the nurse's immediate priority of care is which? A. Provide safety for the client and other clients on the unit. B. Provide the clients on the unit with a sense of comfort and safety. C. Assist the staff in caring for the client in a controlled environment. D. Offer the client a less stimulating area to calm down and gain control. The correct answer is A. Provide safety for the client and other clients on the unit. Rationale, safety of the client and other clients is the priority. Option A is the only option that addresses the client and other clients' safety needs. Option D addresses the client's needs. Option B addresses other clients' needs. Option C is not client-centered. A mother of a teenage client with an anxiety disorder is concerned about her daughter's progress on discharge. She states that her daughter stashes food, eats all the wrong things that make her hyperactive, and hangs out with the wrong crowd. In helping the mother prepare for her daughter's discharge, the nurse should suggest which. A. The mother should restrict the daughter's socializing time with her friends. B. The mother should restrict the amount of chocolate and caffeine products in the home. C. The mother should keep her daughter out of school until she can adjust to the school environment. D. The mother should consider taking time from work to help her daughter readjust to the home environment. The correct answer is B. The mother should restrict the amount of chocolate and caffeine products in the home. Rationale Clients with anxiety disorder should abstain from or limit their intake of caffeine, chocolate, and alcohol. These products have the potential of increasing anxiety. Options 1 and 3 are unreasonable and are an unhealthy approach. It may not be realistic for a family member to take time away from work. The nurse is caring for a client diagnosed with catatonic stupor. The client is lying on the bed with the body pulled into a fetal position. The appropriate nursing intervention is which? A. Ask direct questions to encourage talking. B. Leave the client alone and intermittently check on him. C. Sit beside the client in silence and verbalize occasional open-ended questions. D. Take the client into the day room with other clients so they can help watch him. The correct answer is C. Sit beside the client in silence and verbalize occasional open-ended questions. Rationale, clients with catatonic stupor may be immobile and mute and may require consistent, repeated approaches. The nurse facilitates communication with the client by sitting in silence, asking open-ended questions, and pausing to provide opportunities for the client to respond. The nurse would not leave the client alone. Option D relies on other clients to care for this one, which is an inappropriate expectation. Asking direct questions of this client is not therapeutic. Option C is the best action because it provides for client supervision and communication as appropriate. A client has reported that crying spells have been a major problem over the past several weeks and that the doctor said depression is probably the reason. The nurse observes that the client is sitting slumped in the chair, and the clothes that the client is wearing do not fit well. The nurse interprets that further data collection should focus on which? A. Weight loss. B. Sleep patterns. C. Medication compliance. D. Onset of the crying spells. The correct answer is A. Weight loss. Rationale, all the options are possible issues to address, however, the weight loss is the first item that needs further data collection because ill-fitting clothing could indicate a problem with nutrition. The client has already told the nurse that the crying spells have been a problem. Medication or sleep patterns are not mentioned or addressed in the question. The nurse is caring for a female client who was recently admitted to the hospital for anorexia nervosa. The nurse enters the client's room and notes that the client is doing vigorous push-ups. Which nursing action is appropriate? A. Interrupt the client and weigh her immediately. B. Interrupt the client and offer to take her for a walk. 
C. Allow the client to complete her exercise program. D. Tell the client that she is not allowed to exercise vigorously. The correct answer is B. Interrupt the client and offer to take her for a walk. Rationale Clients with anorexia nervosa are frequently preoccupied with vigorous exercise and push themselves beyond normal limits to work off caloric intake. The nurse must provide for appropriate exercise as well as place limits on vigorous activities. The nursing student is developing a plan of care for the hospitalized client with bulimia nervosa. The nursing instructor intervenes if the student documents which incorrect intervention in the plan. A. Monitor intake and output. B. Monitor electrolyte levels. C. Observe for excessive exercise. D. Monitor for the use of laxatives and diuretics. The correct answer is C. Observe for excessive exercise. Rationale, excessive exercise is a characteristic of anorexia nervosa, not bulimia nervosa. Frequent vomiting, in addition to laxative and diuretic abuse, may lead to dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. Monitoring for both dehydration and electrolyte imbalance is an important nursing action. Option 3 is the only option that is not associated with care of the client with bulimia. Potassium chloride intravenously is prescribed for a client with hypokalemia. Which actions should the nurse take to plan for preparation and administration of the potassium? Select all that apply. A. Obtain an intravenous infusion pump. B. Monitor urine output during administration. C. Prepare the medication for bolus administration. D. Monitor the IV site for signs of infiltration or phlebitis. E. Ensure that the medication is diluted in the appropriate volume of fluid. The correct answers are A. Obtain an intravenous infusion pump. B. Monitor urine output during administration. D. Monitor the IV site for signs of infiltration or phlebitis. And E. Ensure that the medication is diluted in the appropriate volume of fluid. Rationale Potassium chloride administered intravenously must always be diluted in IV fluid and infused via an infusion pump. Potassium chloride is never given by bolus. Giving potassium chloride by IV push can result in cardiac arrest. The nurse should ensure that the potassium is diluted in the appropriate amount of diluent or fluid. The IV site is monitored closely because potassium chloride is irritating to the veins and there is risk of phlebitis. In addition, the nurse should monitor for infiltration. The nurse monitors urinary output during administration and contacts the healthcare provider if the urinary output is less than 30 ml per hour. A client with atrial fibrillation is receiving a continuous heparin infusion at 1,000 units per hour. The nurse determines that the client is receiving the therapeutic effect based on which results. A. Prothrombin time of 12.5 seconds. B. Activated partial thromboplastin time of 60 seconds. C. Activated partial thromboplastin time of 28 seconds. D. Activated partial thromboplastin time longer than 120 seconds. The correct answer is B. Activated partial thromboplastin time of 60 seconds. Rationale Common laboratory ranges for activated partial thromboplastin time are 30 to 40 seconds. Because the activated partial thromboplastin time should be 1.5 to 2.5 times the normal value, the client's activated partial thromboplastin time would be considered therapeutic if it was 60 seconds. Prothrombin time assesses response to warfarin therapy. A client is being treated with procainamide for a cardiac dysrhythmia. Following intravenous administration of the medication, the client complains of dizziness. What intervention should the nurse take first? A. Measure the heart rate on the rhythm strip. B. Administer prescribed nitroglycerin tablets. C. Obtain a 12-lead electrocardiogram immediately. D. Auscultate the client's apical pulse and obtain a blood pressure. 
The correct answer is D. Auscultate the client's apical pulse and obtain a blood pressure. Rationale Signs of toxicity from procainamide include confusion, dizziness, drowsiness, decreased urination, nausea, vomiting, and tachydysrhythmias. If the client complains of dizziness, the nurse should assess the vital signs first. Although measuring the heart rate on the rhythm strip and obtaining a 12 lead electrocardiogram may be interventions, these would be done after the vital signs are taken. Nitroglycerin is a vasodilator and will lower the blood pressure. The nurse is monitoring a client who is taking digoxin for adverse effects. Which findings are characteristic of digoxin toxicity? Select all that apply. A. Tremors. B. Diarrhea. C. Irritability. D. Blurred vision. E. Nausea and vomiting. The correct answers are B. Diarrhea, D. Blurred vision, and E. Nausea and vomiting. Rationale, digoxin is a cardiac glycoside. Toxicity can lead to life-threatening events, and the nurse needs to monitor the client closely for signs of toxicity. Early signs of toxicity include gastrointestinal manifestations such as anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Subsequent manifestations include headache, visual disturbances such as diplopia, blurred vision, yellow-green halos, and photophobia, drowsiness, fatigue, and weakness. Cardiac rhythm abnormalities can also occur. The optimal therapeutic range for digoxin is 0.5 to 0.8 nanograms per milliliter. A client with a clot in the right atrium is receiving a heparin sodium infusion at 1,000 units per hour and warfarin sodium 7.5 milligrams at 5 p.m. daily. The morning laboratory results are as follows, activated partial thromboplastin time, 32 seconds, international normalized ratio, 1.3. The nurse should take which action based on the client's laboratory results? A. Collaborate with the HCP to discontinue the heparin infusion and administer the warfarin sodium as prescribed. B. Collaborate with the HCP to obtain a prescription to increase the heparin infusion and administer the warfarin sodium as prescribed. C. Collaborate with the HCP to withhold the warfarin sodium since the client is receiving a heparin infusion and the activated partial thromboplastin time is within the therapeutic range. D. Collaborate with the HCP to continue the heparin infusion at the same rate and to discuss use of dabigatrin atexalate in place of warfarin sodium. The correct answer is B. Collaborate with the HCP to obtain a prescription to increase the heparin infusion and administer the warfarin sodium as prescribed. Rationale When a client is receiving warfarin for clot prevention, due to atrial fibrillation, an international normalized ratio of 2 to 3 is appropriate for most clients. Until the international normalized ratio has achieved a therapeutic range, the client should be maintained on a continuous heparin infusion with the activated partial thromboplastin time ranging between 60 and 80 seconds. Therefore, the nurse should collaborate with the HCP to obtain a prescription to increase the heparin infusion and to administer the warfarin as prescribed. Prior to administering a client's daily dose of digoxin, the nurse reviews the client's laboratory data and notes the following results, serum calcium, 9.8 mg per deciliter, serum magnesium, 1.0 milliequivalents per liter, serum potassium, 4.1 milliequivalents per liter, serum creatinine, 0.9 mg per deciliter. Which results should alert the nurse that the client is at risk for digoxin toxicity? A. Serum calcium level. B. Serum potassium level. C. Serum creatinine level. D. Serum magnesium level. The correct answer is D. Serum magnesium level. Rationale An increased risk of toxicity exists in clients with hypercalcemia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypothyroidism, and impaired renal function. The calcium, creatinine, and potassium levels are all within normal limits. The normal range for magnesium is 1.3 to 2.1 milliequivalents per liter, and the results in the correct option are reflective of hypomagnesemia.
Intravenous heparin therapy is prescribed for a client. While implementing this prescription, the nurse ensures that which medication is available on the nursing unit. A. Vitamin K. B. Protamine sulfate. C. Potassium chloride. D. Aminocaproic acid. The correct answer is B. Protamine sulfate. Rationale. The antidote to heparin is protamine sulfate, it should be readily available for use, if excessive bleeding, or hemorrhage should occur. Vitamin K is an antidote for warfarin sodium. Potassium chloride is administered for a potassium deficit. Aminocaproic acid is the antidote for thrombolytic therapy. A client being treated for heart failure is administered intravenous bumetanide, which outcome indicates that the medication has achieved the expected effect. A. Cough becomes productive of frothy pink sputum. B. Urine output increases from 10 milliliter per hour to greater than 50 milliliters hourly. C. The serum potassium level changes from 3.8 to 3.1 milliequivalents per liter. D. B-type natriuretic peptide factor increases from 200 to 262 picograms per milliliter. The correct answer is B. Urine output increases from 10 milliliters per hour to greater than 50 milliliters hourly. Rationale, bumetanide is a diuretic and expected outcomes include increased urine output, decreased crackles, and decreased weight. The clinic nurse is providing instructions to a client with hypertension who will be taking captopril. Which statement by the client indicates a need for further instruction? A. I need to change positions slowly. B. I need to avoid taking hot baths or showers. C. I need to drink at least 4 quarts of water daily. D. I need to sit down and rest if dizziness or lightheadedness occurs. The correct answer is C. I need to drink at least 4 quarts of water daily. Rationale, Captopril is an ACE inhibitor. Orthostatic hypotension can occur in clients taking this medication. Adequate fluid is important, but for quarts of water daily, could actually aggravate the hypertension. Clients are advised to avoid standing in one position for long periods, to change positions slowly, and to avoid extreme warmth such as, with baths, showers, or heat from the sun in warm weather. The client should be instructed to monitor for signs of orthostatic hypotension, such as dizziness, lightheadedness, weakness, and syncope. Methylergonavine is prescribed for a woman to treat postpartum hemorrhage. Before the administration of methylergonavine, the nurse should check which priority item. A. Uterine tone. B. Blood pressure. C. Amount of lochia. D. Deep tendon reflexes. The correct answer is B, blood pressure. Rationale, methylergonavine, which is an ergot alkaloid, is an agent that is used to prevent or control postpartum hemorrhage by contracting the uterus. Methylergonavine causes continuous uterine contractions and may elevate the blood pressure. A priority before the administration of the medication is to check the blood pressure. The healthcare provider should be notified if hypertension is present. Although options A, C, and D may be components of the postpartum data collection procedures, but option B is related specifically to the administration of this medication. A pregnant client is receiving magnesium sulfate for the management of preeclampsia. The nurse determines that the client is experiencing toxicity from the medication, if which is noted on data collection. A. Proteinuria of 3+. B. Presence of deep tendon reflexes. C. Serum magnesium level of 6 milliequivalents per liter. D. Respirations of 10 breaths per minute. The correct answer is D. Respirations of 10 breaths per minute. Rationale. Signs of magnesium sulfate toxicity relate to the central nervous system depressant effects of the medication and include respiratory depression, a loss of deep tendon reflexes, and a sudden drop in the fetal heart rate, maternal heart rate, and blood pressure. Therapeutic serum levels of magnesium 
are 4 to 7.5 milli equivalents per liter, or 5 to 8 milligrams per deciliter. Proteinuria of 3 plus is likely to be noted in a client with preeclampsia. The nurse is monitoring a preterm labor client who is receiving magnesium sulfate intravenously. The nurse should monitor for which adverse effects of this medication. Select all that apply. A. Flushing. B. Hypertension. C. Increased urine output. D. Depressed respirations. E. Extreme muscle weakness. F. Hyperactive deep tendon reflexes. The correct answers are A. Flushing, D. Depressed respirations, and E. Extreme muscle weakness. Rationale Magnesium sulfate is a central nervous system depressant and it relaxes smooth muscle, including the uterus. It is used to stop preterm labor contractions, and it is used for preeclamptic clients to prevent seizures. Adverse effects include flushing, depressed respirations, depressed deep tendon reflexes, hypotension, extreme muscle weakness, decreased urine output, pulmonary edema, and elevated serum magnesium levels. Epidural analgesia is administered to a woman for pain relief after a cesarean birth. The nurse assigned to care for the woman ensures that which medication is readily available if respiratory depression occurs. A. Betamethasone. B. Morphine sulfate. C. Naloxone. D. Meperidine hydrochloride. The correct answer is C. Naloxone. Rationale, opioids are used for epidural analgesia. An adverse effect of epidural analgesia is a delayed respiratory depression. Naloxone is an opioid antagonist which reverses the effects of opioids and is given for respiratory depression. Morphine sulfate and meperidine hydrochloride are opioid analgesics. Betamethasone is a corticosteroid that is administered to enhance fetal lung maturity. Roimmune globulin is prescribed for a woman after the delivery of a newborn infant and the nurse provides information to the woman about the purpose of the medication. The nurse determines that the woman understands the purpose of the medication if the woman states that it will protect her next baby from which condition. A. Having Rh positive blood. B. Developing a rubella infection. C. Developing physiological jaundice. D. Being affected by RH incompatibility. The correct answer is D. Being affected by RH incompatibility. Rationale RH incompatibility can occur when a RH negative mother becomes sensitized to the RH antigen. Sensitization may develop when a RH negative woman becomes pregnant with a fetus that is RH positive. During pregnancy and at delivery, some of the baby's Rh-positive blood can enter the maternal circulation, thus causing the woman's immune system to form antibodies against the Rh-positive blood. The administration of Roimmune globulin prevents the woman from developing antibodies against Rh-positive blood by providing passive antibody protection against the Rh antigen. A woman with preeclampsia is receiving magnesium sulfate which indicates to the nurse that the magnesium sulfate therapy is effective. A. Scotomas are present. B. Seizures do not occur. C. Ankle clonus is noted. D. The blood pressure decreases. The correct answer is B. Seizures do not occur. Rationale, for a client with preeclampsia, the goal of care is directed at preventing eclampsia. Magnesium sulfate is an anticonvulsant, rather than an antihypertensive agent. Although a decrease in blood pressure may be noted initially, this effect is usually transient. Scotomas are areas of complete or partial blindness. Visual disturbances, such as scotomas often precede an eclamptic seizure. Ankle clonus indicates hyperreflexia and may precede the onset of eclampsia. The nursing instructor asks a nursing student to describe the procedure for administering erythromycin ointment to the eyes of a neonate. The instructor determines that the student needs to research this procedure further if the student makes which statement. 
A. I will flush the eyes after instilling the ointment. B. I will cleanse the neonate's eyes before instilling the ointment. C. The administration of the eye ointment is within one hour after delivery. D. I will instill the eye ointment into each of the neonate's conjunctival sacs. The correct answer is A. I will flush the eyes after instilling the ointment. Rationale Eye prophylaxis protects the neonate against Neisseria gonorrhoeae and Chlamydia trachomatis. The eyes are not flushed after the installation of the medication because the flush will wash away the administered medication. Methylergonavine is prescribed for a client with postpartum hemorrhage. Before administering the medication, the nurse should question administration of the medication, if which condition is documented in the client's medical history. A. Hypotension B. Hypothyroidism C. Diabetes mellitus D. Peripheral vascular disease The correct answer is D. Peripheral vascular disease. Rationale, methylergonavine is an ergot alkaloid that is used to treat postpartum hemorrhage. Ergot alkaloids are avoided in clients with significant cardiovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, hypertension, eclampsia, or preeclampsia because these conditions are worsened by the vasoconstrictive effects of the ergot alkaloids. A 31-week preterm labor client, dilated to 4 cm, has been started on magnesium sulfate. Her contractions have stopped. If the client's labor can be inhibited for the next 48 hours, which medication does the nurse anticipate will be prescribed? A. Nalbefin B. Betamethasone C. Misoprostol D. Roimmune globulin The correct answer is B. Betamethasone Rationale, betamethasone, which is a glucocorticoid, is given to stimulate fetal lung maturation. It is used for clients in preterm labor, between 28 and 32 weeks gestation, if the labor can be inhibited for 48 hours. Nalbephine is an opioid analgesic. Misoprostol is a prostaglandin that is given to ripen and soften the cervix and to stimulate uterine contractions. Roimmune globulin is given to Rh-negative clients to prevent sensitization. The nurse is caring for a client who is receiving oxytocin to induce labor. The nurse should discontinue the oxytocin infusion, if which is noted on data collection of the client. A. Fatigue B. Drowsiness C. Uterine hyperstimulation D. Early decelerations of the fetal heart rate The correct answer is C. Uterine hyperstimulation. Rationale, oxytocin stimulates uterine contractions, and it is one of the common pharmacological methods used to induce labor. An adverse effect, associated with the administration of the medication, is the hyperstimulation of uterine contractions. Therefore, oxytocin infusion must be stopped when any signs of uterine hyperstimulation are present. Fatigue and drowsiness may be caused by the labor experience. Early decelerations of the fetal heart rate are a reassuring sign and do not indicate fetal distress. The nurse is monitoring a client admitted to the hospital with a diagnosis of appendicitis who is scheduled for surgery in two hours. The client begins to complain of increased abdominal pain and begins to vomit. On assessment, the nurse notes that the abdomen is distended and bowel sounds are diminished. Which is the most appropriate nursing intervention? A. Notify the health care provider. B. Administer the prescribed pain medication. C. Call and ask the operating room team to perform surgery as soon as possible. D. Reposition the client and apply a heating pad on the warm setting to the client's abdomen. The correct answer is A. Notify the health care provider. Rationale, on the basis of the signs and symptoms presented in the question, the nurse should suspect peritonitis and notify the HCP. Administering pain medication is not an appropriate intervention. Heat should never be applied to the abdomen of a client with suspected appendicitis because of the risk of rupture. 
scheduling surgical time is not within the scope of nursing practice, although the HCP probably would perform the surgery earlier than the pre-scheduled time. A client admitted to the hospital with a suspected diagnosis of acute pancreatitis is being assessed by the nurse. Which assessment findings would be consistent with acute pancreatitis? Select all that apply. A. Diarrhea. B. Black, tarry stools. C. Hyperactive bowel sounds. D. Gray-blue color at the flank. E. Abdominal guarding and tenderness. F. Left upper quadrant pain with radiation to the back. The correct answers are D, gray-blue color at the flank, E, abdominal guarding and tenderness, and F, left upper quadrant pain with radiation to the back. Rationale, grayish-blue discoloration at the flank is known as gray Turner's sign and occurs as a result of pancreatic enzyme leakage to cutaneous tissue from the peritoneal cavity. The client may demonstrate abdominal guarding and may complain of tenderness with palpation. The pain associated with acute pancreatitis is often sudden in onset and is located in the epigastric region or left upper quadrant with radiation to the back. A client is diagnosed with viral hepatitis, complaining of no appetite and losing my taste for food. What instruction should the nurse give the client to provide adequate nutrition? A. Select foods high in fat. B. Increase intake of fluids, including juices. C. Eat a good supper when anorexia is not as severe. D. Eat less often, preferably only three large meals daily. The correct answer is B. Increase intake of fluids, including juices. Rationale. Although no special diet is required to treat viral hepatitis, it is generally recommended that clients consume a low-fat diet as fat may be tolerated poorly because of decreased bile production. Small, frequent meals are preferable and may even prevent nausea. Frequently, appetite is better in the morning, so it is easier to eat a good breakfast. An adequate fluid intake of 2500 to 300 milliliter per day that includes nutritional juices is also important. The nurse is assessing a client who is experiencing an acute episode of cholecystitis. Which of these clinical manifestations support this diagnosis? Select all that apply. A. Fever. B. Positive Cullen sign. C. Complaints of indigestion. D. Palpable mass in the left upper quadrant. E. Pain in the upper right quadrant after a fatty meal. F. Vague lower right quadrant abdominal discomfort. The correct answers are A. Fever, C. Complaints of indigestion, and E. Pain in the upper right quadrant after a fatty meal. Rationale During an acute episode of cholecystitis, the client may complain of severe right upper quadrant pain that radiates to the right scapula or shoulder or experience epigastric pain after a fatty or high volume meal. Fever and signs of dehydration would also be expected as well as complaints of indigestion, belching, flatulence, nausea, and vomiting. Options D and F are incorrect because they are inconsistent with the anatomical location of the gallbladder. Option B is associated with pancreatitis. A client has developed hepatitis A after eating contaminated oysters. The nurse assesses the client for which expected assessment finding. A. Malaise b dark stools c weight gain d left upper quadrant discomfort the correct answer is a malaise rationale hepatitis causes gastrointestinal symptoms such as anorexia nausea right upper quadrant discomfort and weight loss fatigue and malaise are common Stools will be light or clay-colored if conjugated bilirubin is unable to flow out of the liver because of inflammation or obstruction of the bile ducts. A client has just had a hemorrhoidectomy. Which nursing interventions are appropriate for this client? Select all that apply. A. Administer stool softeners as prescribed. B. Instruct the client to limit fluid intake to avoid urinary retention. 
C. Encourage a high fiber diet to promote bowel movements without straining. D. Apply cold packs to the anal rectal area over the dressing until the packing is removed. E. Help the client to a fowler's position to place pressure on the rectal area and decrease bleeding. The correct answers are A. Administer stool softeners as prescribed, C. Encourage a high fiber diet to promote bowel movements without straining, and D. Apply cold packs to the anal rectal area over the dressing until the packing is removed. Rationale Nursing interventions after a hemorrhoidectomy are aimed at management of pain and avoidance of bleeding and incision rupture. Stool softeners and a high fiber diet will help the client to avoid straining thereby reducing the chances of rupturing the incision. An ice pack will increase comfort and decrease bleeding. The nurse is planning to teach a client with gastroesophageal reflux disease about substances to avoid. Which items should the nurse include on this list? Select all that apply. A. Coffee. B. Chocolate. C. Peppermint. D. Non-fat milk. E. Fried chicken. F. Scrambled eggs. The correct answers are A. Coffee, B. Chocolate, C. Peppermint, and E. Fried chicken. Rationale Foods that decrease lower esophageal sphincter pressure and irritate the esophagus will increase reflux and exacerbate the symptoms of GERD and therefore should be avoided. Aggravating substances include coffee, chocolate, peppermint, fried or fatty foods, carbonated beverages, and alcohol. The nurse is providing dietary teaching for a client with a diagnosis of chronic gastritis. The nurse instructs the client to include which foods rich in vitamin B12 in the diet. Select all that apply. A. Nuts. B. Corn. C. Liver. D. Apples. E. Lentils. F. Bananas. The correct answers are A. Nuts, C. Liver, and E. Lentils. Rationale Chronic gastritis causes deterioration and atrophy of the lining of the stomach, leading to the loss of function of the parietal cells. The source of intrinsic factor is lost, which results in an inability to absorb vitamin B12 leading to development of pernicious anemia. Clients must increase their intake of vitamin B12 by increasing consumption of foods rich in this vitamin, such as nuts, organ meats, dried beans, citrus fruits, green leafy vegetables, and yeast. A client has undergone esophagogastroduodenoscopy. The nurse should place highest priority on which item as part of the client's care plan. A. Monitoring the temperature. B. Monitoring complaints of heartburn. C. Giving warm gargles for a sore throat. D. Assessing for the return of the gag reflex. The correct answer is D. Assessing for the return of the gag reflex. Rationale The nurse places highest priority on assessing for return of the gag reflex. This assessment addresses the client's airway. The nurse also monitors the client's vital signs and for a sudden increase in temperature, which could indicate perforation of the gastrointestinal tract. This complication would be accompanied by other signs such as pain. Monitoring for sore throat and heartburn are also important, however, the client's airway is the priority. The nurse is assessing a client 24 hours following a cholecystectomy. The nurse notes that the T-tube has drained 750 milliliters of green-brown drainage since the surgery. Which nursing intervention is most appropriate? A. Clamp the T-tube. B. Irrigate the T-tube. C. Document the findings. D. Notify the health care provider. The correct answer is C. Document the findings. Rationale. Following cholecystectomy, drainage from the T-tube is initially bloody and then turns a greenish-brown color. The drainage is measured as output. The amount of expected drainage will range from 500 to 1,000 milliliters per day. The nurse would document the output. The client arrives at the emergency department 
after a burn injury that occurred in the basement at home, and an inhalation injury is suspected. Which should the nurse anticipate as being prescribed for the client? A. Oxygen via nasal cannula at 10 liters. B. Oxygen via nasal cannula at 15 liters. C. 100% oxygen via an aerosol mask. D. 100% oxygen via a tight fitting, non rebreather face mask. The correct answer is D. 100% oxygen via a tight fitting, non rebreather face mask. Rationale If an inhalation injury is suspected, the administration of 100% oxygen via a tight fitting, non rebreather face mask is prescribed until the carboxyhemoglobin level falls below 15%. With inhalation injuries, the oropharynx is inspected for evidence of erythema, blisters, or ulcerations. The need for endotracheal intubation is also determined. The nurse assists in planning care for a child who sustained a burn injury. The nurse plans care based on which accurate statement a. Scarring is not as severe in a child as in an adult. b. Children are at a lower risk of infection than adults because of their strong immune systems. c. Lower burn temperatures and shorter exposure to heat can cause a more severe burn in a child than an adult because a child's skin is thinner. d. Infants and children are at decreased risk for protein and calorie deficiency because they have smaller muscle mass and less body fat than adults. The correct answer is C, lower burn temperatures and shorter exposure to heat can cause a more severe burn in a child than an adult because a child's skin is thinner. Rationale, lower burn temperatures and shorter exposure to heat can cause a more severe burn in a child than an adult because a child's skin is thinner. Scarring is more severe in a child. An immature immune system presents an increased risk of infection for infants and young children. Infants and children are at increased risk for protein and calorie deficiency because they have smaller muscle mass and less body fat than adults. The nurse is caring for a client who has just been admitted to the nursing unit after receiving flame burns to the face and chest. The nurse notes a hoarse cough and the client is expectorating sputum with black flecks. The client suddenly becomes restless and his color is becoming dusky. The nurse should interpret this data as indicating which a. The client is hypotensive b. Pain is present from the burn injury c. The burn has probably caused laryngeal edema, which has occluded the airway d. The client is afraid and is having a panic attack as a result of the unfamiliar surroundings. The correct answer is c. The burn has probably caused laryngeal edema which has occluded the airway. Rationale, the client exhibits several warning signs of an inhalation injury, a history of a flame burn to the face, hoarseness, cough, carbonaceous sputum, singed facial hair, facial edema, and color change. Additionally, one of the cardinal signs of hypoxia is restlessness. The nurse is caring for an infant with a diagnosis of tetralogy of phallate. The infant suddenly becomes cyanotic and the oxygen saturation reading drops to 60%. Which interventions should the nurse perform? Select all that apply. A. Call a code blue. B. Notify the healthcare provider. C. Place the infant in a prone position. D. Prepare to administer morphine sulfate. E. Prepare to administer intravenous fluids. F. Prepare to administer 100% oxygen by face mask. The correct answers are B. Notify the healthcare provider. D. Prepare to administer morphine sulfate. E. Prepare to administer intravenous fluids. And F. Prepare to administer 100% oxygen by face mask. Rationale The child who is cyanotic, with oxygen saturations dropping to 60%, is having a hypercyanotic episode. Hypercyanotic episodes often occur among infants with tetralogy of phallate. If a hypercyanotic episode occurs, the infant is placed in a knee chest position immediately. The HCP is notified. The knee chest position improves systemic arterial oxygen saturation by decreasing venous return, 
so that smaller amounts of highly saturated blood reach the heart. There is no reason to call a code blue unless respirations cease. Additional interventions include administering 100% oxygen by face mask, morphine sulfate, and intravenous fluids as prescribed. The nurse is assisting with caring for a client who is receiving intravenous fluids and who has sustained full thickness burn injuries of the back and legs. The nurse understands that which would provide the most reliable indicator for determining the adequacy of the fluid resuscitation. A. Vital signs. B. Urine output. C. Mental status. D. Peripheral pulses. The correct answer is B. Urine output. Rationale, successful or adequate fluid resuscitation in the adult is signaled by stable vital signs, adequate urine output, palpable peripheral pulses, and a clear sensorium. The most reliable indicator for determining the adequacy of fluid resuscitation is the urine output. For an adult, the hourly urine volume should be 30 to 50 milliliter. A family of a spinal cord injured client rushes to the nursing station, saying that the client needs immediate help. On entering the room, the nurse notes that the client is diaphoretic, with a flushed face and neck, and complains of a severe headache. The pulse is 40 beats per minute, and the blood pressure is 230 over 100. The nurse acts quickly, knowing that the client is experiencing which? A. Spinal shock. B. Pulmonary embolism. C. Autonomic dysreflexia. D. Malignant hyperthermia. The correct answer is C. Autonomic dysreflexia. Rationale, the client with spinal cord injury above the level of T7 is at risk for autonomic dysreflexia. It is characterized by severe, throbbing headache, flushing of the face and neck, bradycardia, and sudden, severe hypertension. Other signs include nasal stuffiness, blurred vision, nausea, and sweating. It is a life-threatening syndrome, triggered by a noxious stimulus, below the level of the injury. The nurse is performing a vaginal check of a pregnant client in labor. The nurse notes that the umbilical cord is protruding from the vagina. Which action should the nurse immediately perform? A. Administer oxygen to the client. B. Transport the client to the delivery room. C. Place an external fetal monitor on the client. D. Exert upward pressure against the presenting part with gloved fingers. The correct answer is D. Exert upward pressure against the presenting part with gloved fingers. Rationale, if the umbilical cord is protruding from the vagina, no attempt should be made to replace it because to do so could traumatize it and further reduce blood flow. The nurse should place a gloved hand into the vagina toward the cervix and exert upward pressure against the presenting part to relieve compression of the cord. The nurse also should wrap the cord loosely in a sterile towel saturated with warm, sterile normal saline solution. Oxygen, 8 to 10 liter per minute by face mask, is administered to the mother to increase fetal oxygenation, and the client is prepared for immediate delivery. However, the immediate action is to relieve pressure on the cord. The client would already have an external fetal monitor in place. A client in the postpartum unit complains of sudden, sharp chest pain. The client is tachycardic, and the respiratory rate is increased, and the healthcare provider diagnoses a pulmonary embolism. Which interventions apply to the care of this client? Select all that apply. A. Administer oxygen. B. Monitor the blood pressure. C. Prepare to administer morphine sulfate. D. Prepare to start an intravenous line. F. Place the client on bed rest in a supine position. E. Prepare to administer warfarin sodium. The correct answers are A. Administer oxygen. B. Monitor the blood pressure. C. Prepare to administer morphine sulfate and D. Prepare to start an intravenous line. Rationale, if pulmonary embolism is suspected, oxygen is administered to decrease hypoxia. The client also is kept on bed rest, with the head of the bed slightly elevated, not supine, to reduce dyspnea. 
morphine sulfate may be prescribed for the client to reduce pain and apprehension. An IV line also will be required and vital signs must be monitored. Heparin therapy is administered. A child is admitted to the burn unit with partial and full thickness burns over 35% of the body. The nurse assisting in caring for the child develops the plan of care. Which nursing intervention is the priority? A. Inserting a Foley catheter. B. Inserting a nasogastric tube. C. Restricting intravenous fluids. D. Sedating the child with morphine sulfate. The correct answer is A. Inserting a Foley catheter. Rationale, a Foley catheter is inserted into the child's bladder so that urine output can be accurately measured hourly. Although pain medication may be required, the child should not be sedated. IV fluids are not restricted and are administered at a rate sufficient to maintain adequate tissue perfusion. A nasogastric tube may be required but would not be the priority intervention. The emergency department nurse is caring for a child, brought to the emergency department, following the ingestion of approximately one half bottle of acetylsalicylic acid. Which should the nurse anticipate as the likely initial treatment? A. Dialysis. B. The administration of vitamin K. C. The administration of activated charcoal. D. The administration of sodium bicarbonate. The correct answer is C. The administration of activated charcoal. Rationale. Initial treatment of salicylate overdose includes administration of activated charcoal to decrease absorption of the aspirin. Intravenous fluids and inducing emesis may be prescribed to enhance excretion but would not be the initial treatment. Dialysis is used in extreme cases if the child is unresponsive to therapy. Vitamin K is the antidote for warfarin overdose. A child is hospitalized with a diagnosis of lead poisoning. The nurse caring for the child should prepare to assist in administering which medication? A. Activated charcoal. B. Sodium bicarbonate. C. Syrup of Ipecac. D. Dimercoprol. The correct answer is D. Dimercoprol. Rationale Dimercoprol is a chelating agent that is administered to remove lead from the circulating blood and from some tissues and organs for excretion in the urine. Sodium bicarbonate may be used in salicylate poisoning. Syrup of Ipecac is used in the hospital setting in poisonings to induce vomiting. Activated charcoal is used to decrease absorption in certain poisoning situations. Note that dimercoprol is prepared with peanut oil and hence should be avoided by clients with known or suspected peanut allergy. The nurse is assisting in preparing to administer acetylcysteine to a client with an overdose of acetaminophen. How should the nurse administer the medication? A. Administer the medication subcutaneously in the deltoid muscle. B. Administer the medication by the intramuscular route in the gluteal muscle. C. Administer the medication by the intramuscular route mixed in 10 ml of normal saline. D. Mix the medication in a flavored ice drink and allow the client to drink the medication through a straw. The correct answer is D. Mix the medication in a flavored ice drink and allow the client to drink the medication through a straw. Rationale, because acetylcysteine has a pervasive odor of rotten eggs, it must be disguised in a flavored ice drink. It is consumed preferably through a straw to minimize contact with the mouth. It is not administered by the intramuscular or subcutaneous route. A client who sustained an inhalation injury arrives in the emergency department. On data collection, the nurse notes that the client is very confused and combative. The nurse determines that the client is experiencing which? A. Fear. B. Pain. C. Hypoxia. D. Anxiety. The correct answer is C. Hypoxia. Rationale, after a burn injury, clients are normally alert. 
If a client becomes confused or combative, hypoxia may be the cause. Hypoxia occurs after inhalation injury and may occur after an electrical injury. A client is brought to the emergency department following a smoke inhalation injury. The initial nursing action is to prepare the client to receive which treatment? A. Pain medication. B. Endotracheal intubation. C. Oxygen via nasal cannula. D. 100% humidified oxygen by face mask. The correct answer is D. 100% humidified oxygen by face mask. Rationale, if the client sustains a smoke inhalation injury, the client is treated immediately with 100% humidified oxygen delivered by face mask. Oxygen via nasal cannula will not provide adequate oxygenation. Endotracheal intubation is needed if the client exhibits respiratory strider, which then indicates airway obstruction. Pain management is necessary but is not the initial concern. An emergency department nurse is caring for a client who sustained a burn injury to the anterior arms and anterior chest area. The client sustained the burn from a home fire that occurred in the basement. Which data would indicate that the client sustained a respiratory injury as a result of the burn? A. Fear and anxiety. B. Complaints of pain. C. Clear breath sounds. D. Use of accessory muscles for breathing. The correct answer is D. Use of accessory muscles for breathing. Rationale, clinical indicators in a burn client that would indicate respiratory injury include the presence of facial burns, the presence of soot around the mouth or nose, and singed nasal hairs. Signs of respiratory difficulty include changes in respiratory rate, and the use of accessory muscles for breathing. Although anxiety may be a sign of hypoxemia, anxiety along with bradycardia, dysrhythmias, and lethargy would most likely indicate a concern related to a respiratory injury. Abnormal breath sounds and abnormal arterial blood gas values would also be noted. Pain is not specifically related to a respiratory injury. The nurse assists in administering first aid to a client who has been bitten by a snake on the right leg. The nurse should take which action? A. Apply a tourniquet. B. Apply ice to the site of the bite. C. Elevate the leg above the level of the heart. D. Ensure that the victim is lying down and remove restrictive items. The correct answer is D. Ensure that the victim is lying down and remove restrictive items. Rationale. Initial first aid at the site of a snake bite includes having the victim lie down, removing constrictive items such as clothing or rings, providing warmth, cleansing the wound, covering the wound with a light sterile dressing, and immobilizing the injured body part below the level of the heart. Ice or a tourniquet is not applied during the acute stage. A postpartum client has lost 700 milliliter of blood. The vital signs indicate hypovolemia, and the uterus remains atonic in spite of treatment. The nurse assisting in caring for the client understands what is necessary in this situation and prepares the client for which treatment? A. Fundal massage. B. A blood transfusion. C. Emergency surgery. D. An infusion of oxytocin. The correct answer is C. Emergency surgery. Rationale. Options A, B, and D identify interventions to reverse uterine adenine. When uterine adenine cannot be reversed, surgery is required. The nurse receives a telephone call from a neighbor who states that her child was found sitting on the floor near the kitchen sink, playing with several bottles of cleaning fluids. The bottles of cleaning fluid were opened and spilled on the child and the floor, and the mother suspects that the child may have consumed some of the cleaning fluid. Which action should the nurse tell the mother to do immediately? A. Call the health care provider. B. Call the poison control center. C. Call the pharmacy to purchase syrup of Ipecac for administration. D. Call an ambulance to bring the child to the emergency department. 
The correct answer is B, call the poison control center. Rationale, the poison control center should be called if an unknown toxic agent has been ingested or if it is necessary to identify an antidote for a known toxic agent. Syrup of Ipecac is used to induce vomiting in a conscious client, but vomiting is not induced after ingestion of caustic substances or petroleum distillates. In addition, it is inadvisable for parents to administer syrup of Ipecac, this action, if warranted, should be done under medical supervision. Calling an ambulance or calling the health care provider will delay necessary life-saving measures. The nurse discusses emergency nursing measures that are implemented at the site of an injury with a nursing student. Which initial action does the nurse tell the student to perform in the event of carbon monoxide poisoning? A. Carry the client to fresh air. B. Wrap the client in blankets. C. Keep the client as quiet as possible. D. Initiate cardiopulmonary resuscitation. The correct answer is A. Carry the client to fresh air. Rationale Whenever a victim inhales a poison, the victim is carried immediately to fresh air. Any tight clothing is then loosened and CPR is initiated if necessary. Oxygen is administered as soon as possible. Chilling is prevented and the victim is wrapped in blankets and kept as quiet as possible. A client who sustained a severe burn injury is brought to the emergency department. The nurse prepares to implement which immediate action? A. Insert an endotracheal tube. B. Assess neurological function. C. Administer 100% humidified oxygen. D. Cover the client with a warm blanket. The correct answer is C. Administer 100% humidified oxygen. Rationale When a victim who sustains a burn injury arrives at the emergency department, a patent airway is established and breathing is assessed immediately. The client is also immediately given 100% humidified oxygen. If the victim has severe respiratory distress, or airway edema, then an endotracheal tube is inserted for mechanical ventilation. Clean sheets are placed over the client and the client's body temperature is maintained. The client's neurological status is assessed, however, this is not the immediate action. The nurse is performing a follow-up teaching session with a client discharged one month ago. The client is taking fluoxetine. Which information would be important for the nurse to obtain during this client visit regarding the side and adverse effects of the medication? A. Cardiovascular symptoms. B. Gastrointestinal dysfunctions. C. Problems with mouth dryness. D. Problems with excessive sweating. The correct answer is B. Gastrointestinal dysfunctions. Rationale. The most common side and adverse effects related to fluoxetine include central nervous system and gastrointestinal system dysfunction. Fluoxetine affects the gastrointestinal system by causing nausea and vomiting, cramping, and diarrhea. Cardiovascular symptoms, dry mouth, and excessive sweating are not side and adverse effects associated with this medication. A client who has been taking buspirone for one month returns to the clinic for a follow-up assessment. The nurse determines that the medication is effective if the absence of which manifestation has occurred. A. Paranoid thought process. B. Rapid heartbeat or anxiety. C. Alcohol withdrawal symptoms. D. Thought broadcasting or delusions. The correct answer is B. Rapid heartbeat or anxiety. Rationale. Buspirone is not recommended for the treatment of paranoid thought disorders, drug or alcohol withdrawal, or schizophrenia. Buspirone most often is indicated for the treatment of anxiety. A client gives the home health nurse a bottle of clomipramine. The nurse notes that the medication has not been taken by the client in two months. Which behavior observed in the client would validate noncompliance with this medication? A. Complaints of insomnia. B. Complaints of hunger and fatigue. 
C. A pulse rate less than 60 beats per minute. D. Frequent hand washing with hot, soapy water. The correct answer is D. Frequent hand washing with hot, soapy water. Rationale Clomipramine is a tricyclic antidepressant used to treat obsessive compulsive disorder. Sedation sometimes occurs. Insomnia seldom is a side effect. Weight gain and tachycardia are side and adverse effects of this medication. A client taking lithium reports vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea, blurred vision, tinnitus, and tremors. The lithium level is 2.5 milliequivalents per liter. The nurse plans care based on which representation of this level. A. Toxic. B. Normal. C. Slightly above normal. D. Excessively below normal. The correct answer is A. Toxic. Rationale. Maintenance serum levels of lithium are 0.6 to 1.2 milliequivalents per liter. Symptoms of toxicity begin to appear at levels of 1.5 to 2 milliequivalents per liter. Lithium toxicity requires immediate medical attention with lavage and possible peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis. A hospitalized client has begun taking bupropion as an antidepressant agent. The nurse determines that, which is an adverse effect, indicating that the client is taking an excessive amount of medication. A. Constipation. B. Seizure activity. C. Increased weight. D. Dizziness when getting upright. The correct answer is B. Seizure activity. Rationale. Seizure activity can occur in clients taking bupropion dosages greater than 450 mg daily. Weight gain is an occasional side effect, whereas constipation is a common side effect of this medication. This medication does not cause significant orthostatic blood pressure changes. The nurse should provide instructions concerning which side effect to a client prescribed chlorpromazine. A. Dry mouth. B. Hand tremors. C. Lip smacking. D. Increased urinary output. The correct answer is A. Dry mouth. Rationale, chlorpromazine is an antipsychotic medication that belongs to the phenothiazine group. Side effects of chlorpromazine can include hypotension, dizziness, and fainting, especially with parenteral use. Additional side effects include drowsiness, blurred vision, dry mouth, lethargy, constipation or diarrhea, nasal congestion, peripheral edema, and urinary retention. A monoamine oxidase inhibitor is prescribed for a client. Which sign or symptom is indicative of toxicity? A. Lethargy. B. Depression. C. Restlessness. D. Constipation. The correct answer is C. Restlessness. Rationale. Acute toxicity of monoamine oxidase inhibitors is manifested by restlessness, anxiety, and insomnia. Dizziness and hypertension also can occur in acute toxicity. The remaining options are not signs of toxicity related to MAOI. To determine whether the client is experiencing akathisia as an adverse effect of the medication haloperidol, what should the nurse observe the client for? A. Lip smacking. B. Puffing of the cheeks. C. Rapid tongue movements. D. Restlessness or constant generalized movement. The correct answer is D. Restlessness or constant generalized movement. Rationale. Akathisia is restlessness or an urge to keep moving. It may appear within six hours of administration of the first dose and may be difficult to distinguish from psychotic agitation. The other options describe tardive dyskinesia, which is manifested by uncontrolled rhythmic movements of the mouth, face, and extremities. These movements can include lip smacking or puckering, puffing of the cheeks, uncontrolled chewing, and the presence of rapid or undulating movements of the tongue. A client diagnosed with anxiety is starting therapy with lorazepam. 
which factor in the client's history, should prompt the nurse to consult with the healthcare provider before administering the medication. A. Hypothyroidism. B. Diabetes mellitus. C. Narrow angle glaucoma. D. Coronary artery disease. The correct answer is C, narrow angle glaucoma. Rationale, lorazepam is a benzodiazepine and is contraindicated in hypersensitivity, cross-sensitivity with other benzodiazepines, comatose state, pre-existing central nervous system depression, uncontrolled severe pain, and narrow angle glaucoma. It also is contraindicated in pregnancy and in women who are breastfeeding. None of the other options are relevant to the administration of lorazepam. A client has a lithium level of 2.4 milliequivalents per liter. The nurse should immediately assess the client for which sign or symptom. A. Diarrhea. B. Weakness. C. Blurred vision. D. Cardiac dysrhythmias. The correct answer is C. Blurred vision. Rationale, at lithium levels of 2.0 to 2.5 milliequivalents per liter, the client will experience blurred vision, muscle twitching, severe hypotension, and persistent nausea and vomiting. With levels between 1.5 and 2.0 milliequivalents per liter, the client experiences vomiting, diarrhea, muscle weakness, ataxia, dizziness, slurred speech, and confusion. At lithium levels of 2.5 to 3.0 milliequivalents per liter, or higher, urinary and fecal incontinence occurs, as well as seizures, cardiac dysrhythmias, peripheral vascular collapse, and death. The mother of a child, diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, has been given instructions about how to administer methylphenidate. Which response by the mother shows she understands the information about the best way to administer the medication? A. At bedtime. B. After breakfast. C. At the evening meal. D. With a bedtime snack. The correct answer is B. After breakfast. Rationale Children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder should take the morning dose after breakfast, and the last daily dose should be taken at least six hours before bedtime to prevent insomnia. A client diagnosed with depression has a prescription for sertraline. The nurse should withhold the medication and question the prescription if the client has a history of which of the following. A. Diabetes mellitus. B. Myocardial infarction. C. Phenylzine sulfate use. D. Irritable bowel syndrome. The correct answer is C. Phenylzine sulfate use. Rationale. Sertraline is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Fatal reactions may occur if sertraline is administered concurrently with phenylzine, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. MAOI should be stopped at least 14 days before initiation of sertraline therapy. Likewise, sertraline should be stopped at least 14 days before initiation of MAOI therapy. The nurse should assess for which toxic effect, when managing the care of a client, prescribed haloperidol. A. Nausea. B. Hypotension. C. Blurred vision. D. Excessive salivation. The correct answer is D. Excessive salivation. Rationale Haloperidol is an antipsychotic medication. Toxic effects include marked drowsiness and lethargy, excessive salivation, a fixed stare, akathisia, acute dystonia, and tardive dyskinesia. Nausea, hypotension, and blurred vision are occasional side effects. A client diagnosed with bipolar mood disorder has been given a prescription for carbamazepine. The nurse teaching the client about medication side and adverse effects instructs the client to notify the healthcare provider if which symptom develops. A. Nausea. B. Dizziness. C. Sore throat. D. Drowsiness. The correct answer is C, sore throat. Rationale, carbamazepine may be prescribed for a client 
with a bipolar mood disorder to provide symptomatic control of the disorder. An adverse effect of carbamazepine is blood dyscrasia. With development of a fever, sore throat, mouth ulcerations, unusual bleeding, bruising, or joint pain, the healthcare provider should be notified because these findings may indicate a blood dyscrasia. Nausea, dizziness, drowsiness, and vomiting are frequent side effects associated with the medication. When should the nurse advise a client being prescribed fluoxetine hydrochloride to take the medication? A. Just before bedtime. B. With the evening meal. C. At noon with an antacid. D. In the morning on first arising. The correct answer is D. In the morning on first arising. Rationale. Fluoxetine hydrochloride is an antidepressant and is administered in the early morning so that the client will experience an elevated mood during the daytime hours. In addition, fluoxetine can cause insomnia, so taking the medication early in the day will prevent interference with sleep. When a client develops neuroleptic malignant syndrome, the nurse ensures that which medication is available on the unit to address this complication. A. Phytonadian B. Bromocryptine C. Protamine sulfate D. Analapril maleate. The correct answer is B. Bromocryptine. Rationale Clients taking antipsychotic medications are at risk for neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Bromocryptine, an anti Parkinsonian prolactin inhibitor, is used in the treatment of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Phytonadian is the antidote for warfarin overdose. Protamine sulfate is the antidote for heparin overdose. Analapril maleate is an angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitor used to treat hypertension. A client diagnosed with schizophrenia is taking haloperidol. The nurse understands that this medication will exert its therapeutic effect through which mechanism? A. Blocking serotonin reuptake. B. Inhibiting the breakdown of released acetylcholine. C. Blocking the uptake of norepinephrine and serotonin. D. Blocking dopamine from binding to postsynaptic receptors in the brain. The correct answer is D. Blocking dopamine from binding to postsynaptic receptors in the brain. Rationale Haloperidol is an antipsychotic. Haloperidol acts by blocking the binding of dopamine to the postsynaptic dopamine receptors in the brain. Fluoxetine hydrochloride is a potent serotonin reuptake blocker. Donapezyl hydrochloride inhibits the breakdown of released acetylcholine. Imipramine hydrochloride blocks the uptake of norepinephrine and serotonin. The nurse assesses for a therapeutic effect of zeprasidone by asking the client which question. A. Have you had more restful sleep during daytime naps? B. Have you experienced relief of heartburn and indigestion with meals? C. Have you experienced an increase in concentration during daily activities? D. Have you had a decrease in heart palpitations with outside physical activities? The correct answer is C. Have you experienced an increase in concentration during daily activities? Rationale Zeprasidone is an antipsychotic used as a mood stabilizer. The nurse should evaluate a therapeutic response by determining if the client obtained an increase in concentration. None of the remaining options are related to the use of this medication. A client diagnosed with bipolar disorder is prescribed lithium carbonate. The nurse who administers the medication knows that lithium is used primarily to treat which condition? A. Short-term memory loss. B. The manic phase of bipolar disease. C. Both depressive and manic episodes. D. The depressive phase of bipolar disease. The correct answer is B. The manic phase of bipolar disease. Rationale. Lithium is an anti-manic medication and is used to treat the manic phase of a manic depressive disorder.